Yay. Great. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah. So, um, thank you all for coming again to these panel discussions. Um, we're all volunteers for Integrative Healers Action Network with the mission of transforming trauma into resiliency for communities that are impacted by disaster. Um, you guys have all dedicated so much of your time to this organization, so I just I wanna thank you for that. This is obviously not our traditional response to um, disaster, but I appreciate that you guys are pivoting and that we've moved this response to virtual and the idea of these panels is to share with people your experience in your different modalities the topic today being anxiety and stress so that they can identify if they're experiencing those things we kind of throw those words around a lot anxiety and stress um i don't know really understand what that looks like and how it manifests in the body and in their response to things. So I could just share, um, say, just say who you are and what you do, um, maybe a little bit about what that means. Some people may not know about homeopathy and naturopathy. So if you could just um, introduce yourself and say what you do and then just share with us your thoughts around anxiety and stress. Chris, do you want to start? Sure. I'm Dr. Chris Holder. I'm a naturopathic doctor in Santa Rosa, California, and uh, I've been working with iHand from the start. And uh, this is a time of extreme change for folks. Our lives have been totally changed in all manners of speaking. We're wearing masks now. Some of us have nice fashionable ones made by our sisters. Some of us have the regular old ones, um, social, the way we interact socially is being changed. Um, and um, the thing I, I really have been working with my patients is to really pin down what's bugging them the most and where that resides in the body. You know, so for me, it's frequently my neck and just considering ways that I can either mobilize that body part or mobilize the energy running through it from kind of a Chinese medicine perspective. Um, I think a lot of us on this panel work with movement of energy of different sorts. I think of emotions as a type of energy that just needs to be moved and ideally expressed. You know, if we hold our anger and anxiety in or our fear, then, um, and then that can cause us harm. And then if we express it in ways that cause others harm, that's not ideal either. Um, so first kind of just identifying, you know, what is it I'm feeling? Where do I, where do I have it in my body? And then how can I release it and not continue carrying it if possible? You know, and from there we kind of discuss ways of doing that. I'll go ahead and pause for now and let somebody else jump in because I can talk forever. Well, I'm Kathleen Shively, and I'm a board-certified classical homeopath. And for those that aren't familiar with homeopathic medicine, it is a very specific um, form of natural medicine. A lot of folks think that it means sort of all things natural, but it actually is something really specific. Um, so basically working with very small amounts of natural substances to stimulate the body's own healing response. And the other thing to know is that often we're recommending homeopathic remedies that are very specific to the person based on the symptoms they're having, but also based on their health history. And that's mostly what I do. So when I'm working with people, including now during the, during the pandemic and during shelter in place, mostly all meeting with people remotely so far, um, really just, as Chris said, really just, looking at for that person what's most limiting for them in the moment because often that does relate to stress and anxiety not always but certainly during more stressful times we see the mind-body connection the continuum where we're looking for where is that stuckness or where's the limitation for the person and sometimes it's really obvious such as 
as you mentioned, pain in the neck <laughs> or chronic pain. Um, and sometimes it's not as obvious, especially if uh, with stress and anxiety, often people will say, you know, I don't tend to get stressed out, but I started having panic attacks out of the blue or something like that. Doesn't necessarily need to be that dramatic for it to be limiting to a person, but it's interesting how we can sort of fool ourselves into thinking that we're, we're handling everything okay. And then suddenly, you know, as, as Chris, I think you mentioned too, like if you're pushing it down, especially suppressing it and trying to just carry on without acknowledging it really, um, then often it does start to come in these ways where it's out of, feels like it's out of the blue and I'm not sure why this is happening. Um, so whether that is pain or anxiety, panic attacks, or something else, it could be digestive issues, it could be people's kind of chronic areas of susceptibility getting flared up. And certainly, I've been working with a lot of people with that um, in the last couple of months, just whatever they tend to get, it's more so, right? And as, as we all know from when we're stressed out or not getting good sleep, um, we tend to get those things. So. So yeah, um, I can say that uh, as far as case examples, um, they really run the gamut um, from those that are more kind of constitutional and specific to the person. But I will say when, when a situation like this is happening and there's a lot of fear and anxiety in the general population, uh, there are a few homeopathic remedies that have been really helpful for people such as aconite, um, is, is a big one for sometimes panic attacks. There are many that could be helpful with that, but it's, it's a helpful one, um, aconitum napellus in a 30C or a 200C potency, which you can find over the counter. And I found it's not a generic for stress relief, but it has helped many people during times of acute anxiety when again, they're sort of have this restless energy and picking up on that restless energy from the rest of you know people around them essentially it's in the atmosphere that kind of stress um, but again with with homeopathy we're always looking to individualize more to the person so there might may be a few other there there are many there are thousands of homeopathic remedies that can help people but just to be aware that it it is in part about your um, specific symptoms so we're working together to try to identify what that is and, and the other thing that I really like, which is not a homeopathic remedy, but I found it helpful in dealing with my own uh, lever, level of over, overwhelm during the pandemic, and also in working with IHAN after the fires, is just some really basic breathing exercises. With breathing in, I like to the count of four, breathing in, holding for seven, and breathing out to the count of eight. I think the most important being breathing out longer than you have breathed in and doing that even for a few minutes, but on a regular basis can help tone the nervous system and also in the moment help to calm the nervous system down, especially if you're able to breathe all the way into your belly. So it's just a really nice, simple grounding, um, de-stressing tool that you don't need any resources for other than your own breath. Thank you so much, Kathleen. And did you want to just mention briefly about the free clinics that you're holding? Yeah, thank you. Um, we're going to start this week with IHAN offering a free virtual homeopathic clinic from 2 to 4 p.m. where people can sort of just virtually drop in. You don't have to have an appointment at this time to um, come our Zoom channel will be um, available, right? Um, I believe posted on the uh, Facebook page. So, um, and as I mentioned, so what we would be doing is meeting with you on a one-on-one -on -one basis individually to kind of go through what symptoms are coming up for you the most in terms of what's limiting you and help to identify one homeopathic remedy that can help shift you in a, a place of greater health um, just based on those symptoms. So um, hope to see you there. Great, thank you. Jen, I would love to hear your thoughts about stress and anxiety because you have such a different perspective um, in nature, so. Yeah, 
Um, so my name is Jenny Harrell. I am the co-founder and executive director of Integrative Healers Action Network. And in addition to my work with IHAN, I am an integrative health coach and my passion work is as an nature therapy guide. I lead forest bathing walks for groups, for individuals. Um, yeah, for me, nature connection and spending mindfulness or connecting mindfulness with spending time in nature are one of my really go-tos for managing stress. Um, yeah, I discovered it during, well, discovered the field of it during my, my master's program in integrative health studies when I stumbled upon the field of ecotherapy and went, had this huge realization of like, well, this is, this is my go-to for managing stress and overwhelm and anxiety because it's, um, you know, and going deeper into the, the research of it, I ended up writing my thesis on forest bathing and the practice that is innate to all humans. I mean, it's, it's not a new practice, even though but it's, it's a new term, forest bathing, which comes from the, the Japanese term shinrin-yoku, which means to, to bathe in the forest atmosphere. Um, in Japan, they they developed these nature therapy programs in the early 80s as actually a response to the chronic stress epidemic that was happening in Japan. During that time, they were seeing that a lot of Japanese workers were actually dying from overstress and from overwork and, um, and started doing a lot of clinical trials and research of showing the, the benefits of spending time in nature and what happens both physically psychologically, even going deeper spiritually, but um, physically they were able to show some pretty cool results of things like that, you know, something as simple as smelling the essential oils that trees emit can reduce cortisol levels, the stress hormone up to up to 30%. It can reduce inflammation, um, reduce, you know, blood pressure and increase natural killer cells you know there's a whole laundry list of really beautiful benefits for just spending time in nature in a way that is just opening up your senses and and practicing um just noticing really and so that to me has been really essential during this time especially because we're even more inundated with screen time and with um an influx of news, which feels like every couple of minutes we're getting, all right, this is happening now. And, and feeling in myself of like this heightened just activation in the nervous system of like, okay, now, now there's this and now there's this and acclimating and adjusting. And so, um, you know, even before this pandemic, the research was showing that Americans on average were spending about less than 5% of their, their whole day outdoors. You know, we had a, an addiction to technology and um, and work, really. You know, I mean, I've seen some some memes out there recently of like, you know, this is an incredibly stressful situation what we're going through right now, this global pandemic. But what was happening culturally before this was was also pretty stressful too. Of our, um, you know busy work lives, commuting, and constant inundation with information. And so my, my go-to right now is still coming back to, to just slowing down and spending time in nature, um, even though I don't, and we don't all have access to the same, you know, state parks and regional parks and national parks that we usually have at our disposal, just even going out in our backyard or if we're living in the city, going out into the street and connecting with a tree, finding a house plant. Um, I mean, there's been research showing that even, even pictures of nature, like they've done this research of, in hospitals of like someone who's resting and recovering in a hospital bed, like has a, a faster recovery time if there's a picture of a beautiful natural image rather than just looking at a, a brick wall or something. And so um, we can trick our minds into thinking that we're surrounded by beauty um, even if we don't have the same freedom to, to move as much as we're used to. And so, um, so that is really huge right now. And then, you know, Kathleen, I'm glad you mentioned the breathing that to me, 
is just a, an essential practice throughout the day. I was, it was actually funny as you were bringing it up, I was doing the box breathing myself because I was feeling this activation of like, oh great, now we're, we're in front of a live panel and figuring out the budget buttons to get this to go live. And, um, and so it's like noticing my heart rate go up and noticing that activation in myself. And it's like, well, what can I do in this moment? I can really just come back to my breath. And I could feel my heart rate start to go down as I was doing that. And so I think with all that, like constant activation that is happening, the, the practice of coming back to our breath, any meditation practice that is available to you, um, you know, just giving ourselves and giving our, our minds the training to like evoke any sort of pause because these are such reactive times. I mean, we're, we're constantly inundated with new information all the time. And I find it where it's like, all right, now we're activated about this. And, and so with the practice of meditation, of just being able to train um, and create new neural pathways in our brain to not just be so reactive. And that to me is kind of like a preventative stress manager where it's like, we know that these are stressful times and what is the training that we can do to help mitigate the, the long-term impacts of that and then the daily impacts of not just being in the super reactive mode. So, um, and I find that that going out in nature is a great tool for that in terms of just like, if we can't feel resource enough to come back to our breath where it's like, all right, I'm going to go outside and, and connect with a tree or a flower or a bird and notice the way that that tree is moving in the wind and maybe allow my body to mimic that, like mimicking the way the, the leaves are moving and the branches are moving and kind of bringing our own somatic awareness back to ourself with this mirror of what is happening in nature, the natural rhythms that are there to, um, that are to support us. So. I love that. It's such a beautiful image to, to, you know, I'm sitting here going like this while you're saying, mm -hmm. um, I have a tree outside my window and I'm like, wow, that's really relaxing. Um, and that same idea of, you know, when you lay on the ground, the resonance of the earth, you know, has that calming effect. It actually has that frequency for the human body to really have it connect in and, and feel kind of held. Um, I don't know that many people realize that when they lay down under a tree and all of a sudden they're just so tired, they could just take a nap, um, you know, that you're just bathed in that. So I love that, that you talk about the science around that and, and the studies they've done with nature and stress and anxiety. And you also said one more thing that I would love to hear the panel discuss is, you know, what are the long-term effects of the stress and anxiety that people are feeling now? And what are some tools um, that they can do in this moment um, to deal with the long term? And what should they notice? You know, one of the things that I've noticed is it's become this, this uh, subconscious fear around being close to people. And even cars now are, are separating themselves. And I wonder if, if you guys can just talk to any of that briefly. I think what that brings up for me is a little bit of the concept of we're always taught that anxiety is sort of about the, um, the future. And we're in a situation now where it's very hard to plan for our futures. Um, each day brings different stuff that we have to adjust to. And um, for those of us that are really into planning things and have our lives planned out through months, this can be really stressful. But I always, I always try to remind everyone that the future doesn't really exist until we're there. And so it's really the present moment that we have to ground ourselves in. And so there's a lot of practices, meditation, Qigong, um, certain types of yoga that can really help um, anchor us in the present. And in the present right now, I'm safe, I'm taken care of, I'm fed, things are calm. Um, and really operate out of the present, I think is a, and there's so many ways, um, most of the pleasurable things that we enjoy in life um, are grounded in the present, whether you like jumping out of airplanes, it's because you're very present, 
surfers have to be very present or they'll get knocked off the wave. Uh, but we can find ways to um, stay really present in here and now. Yeah, it's, it's, it made me think when you talked about, you know, some of the, I know so definitely some of my clients, people I'm working with through this pandemic are the anxiety is moving into some um, more fear-based and in some cases you could say more obsessive kind of thoughts or behaviors. And I think in some ways it's kind of a natural working through of the amount of stress and information coming at us and people not really having a frame of reference for how much is enough, you know, what's, we, we, there's so much we still don't know about this virus as well. So I think there can be, we, you know, as humans, we tend not to do very well with uncertainty. It's to your point, Chris, about the future, but also a, without any context for something that we're unfamiliar with. So I think people are looking for, you know, we can sort of get into this groove of, you know, either impulsive or compulsive, you know, hand washing or fear or like feelings of panic when we're in the grocery store, because just not knowing whether we're safe, essentially, and that is a really basic form of anxiety and stress. Um, it's primal, you know, and so it, it can be about, yeah, we're, we're all talking about various tools to ground ourselves in the ability to just know that we are safe in the moment that it's detached from what may happen in the future. And to just, I think it does kind of come back to the breath. And even as, you know, lots of people can't really connect with the idea of meditation so easily, even if they want to. So I like some of these simpler ideas and concepts around breath counting and being in nature, because I think it's more accessible for people to feel more quickly grounded when things are so uncertain right now, you know? Um, I'm noticing that um, certainly on the homeopathic side of things, it's within the range of what we help people with, with a homeopathic remedy. And again, it depends a bit upon the specific manifestation of what it is that they're, they're having re repeating thoughts about. Um, or, you know, perhaps it's at night when they're in bed, you know, when all these thoughts come up and fears and anxieties for, for many people, um, so then again, we're more individualizing to shift, to help to let go of that pattern because it can be just a pattern of stress that our body hangs on to, but also that our mind and really spiritually we, ha we ha could hang on to. And so Cynthia, your question about how the long-term effects, I mean, I think again, um, Nadine Burke Harris and the work she's drawing attention to around the ACEs, um, toxic stress uh, effects on children, that that study I believe was done in the 70s, is helping to shine a light on the effect of chronic stress, um, whether or not it's for kids, but I, I think it makes sense to, to focus on kids in a non-pandemic situation um, for that. But, Anyway, that it's, it's, you know, it's huge. It, it, unfortunately, it results in a huge amount of increased susceptibility to chronic disease of many kinds, diabetes, heart disease, you know, metabolic issues of all kinds, uh, ADHD, hyperactivity. So, you know, as we're talking about, you know, ways to notice, it's just to put emphasis on is that it is actually very important to take it seriously and to do, to find ways of helping yourself and your family with the stress because putting it away is going to have some long-term big consequences for your health. And I know that can feel like a catch 22 situation <laughs> when you're stressed out. Um, so, but the main, the first important first step is just to identify it and to feel okay to, to reach out even to friends and trusted you know, maybe family members um, trying to at least acknowledge the fact that you're stressed out. And then from there, you'll find some solutions. I like wh where you're going there too with um, resolving it in that stress can also bring out the best of us. Mm. You know, when, we, when we're able to identify what needs to be done and then catalyze that into beautiful action and change. Yeah. 
the world changes, we change. Um, I recently had, I have a number of patients that are single and alone by themselves. And I found that they, they tend to have the highest stress levels because I, I think they're just not being touched and all their interaction is through this, this new world that we're in of the screens. And I've, I've been recommending that they do a lot of things that are very tactile, take an Epsom salt bath or more mud bath, skin brushing, um, activating this, the skin portion of things. Cause a lot of us don't realize how much of our immune system and stress levels are linked to touch. We're social primates. Um, Robert Sapolsky at Stanford has done a lot of work on this. Um, we're, we're meant to groom each other and groom in safe ways. And, um, more of our health is related to that than we ever realized until they started researching it. Um, his book is why zebras don't get ulcers for folks that are interested in that. I love that. And can you, even anybody on the panel, you know, one of the, the, demographics um, that are really getting a lot of publicity right now are the frontline workers and the disaster workers. And, you know, I can't imagine the amount of stress that those people are under because they're dealing with all of the things that you guys have talked about, but they're also dealing with their own internal stuff, right? And so what are some tools for, for frontline workers um, or disaster workers that you can offer up knowing that they don't have a lot of time, they, they don't have a lot of access to things. What are some things that those people can do? I've got one. Whenever I work with teams in stressful situations like that, I always kind of use the metaphor of the marathon and that we need to take breaths, uh, breaks and take breaths and to pace ourselves um, and to know when we need a break. And, and that can include just information as well um, for frontline workers. Um, our, our jobs rely on information and sometimes we can be overloaded in that search. And so taking a little fast for news, knowing that we know enough now to help people um, because that can be its own wear and tear. Yeah, and I will reiterate also because I think we had a question on Facebook to reiterate about the breathing exercise, but I think it's also a, another good one for frontline workers because it's within their control. <laughs> and I know that often I, I believe that in this current medical environment, dep depending on where you are, for example, if you're in New York and you're overloaded, you may not be able to take a break, essentially. You, you may have to just be in that adrenalized, be on it for as long as possible. But I appreciate what you're saying, Chris, because I mean, I think the reality is if we don't take even micro breaks, everyone suffers. The patients suffer, we suffer, you know, it's not good. So maybe a way of doing that is with a short, um, you know, just two minutes of the breathing in and again, I like the breathe in to the count of four. And you can either do this sitting or standing, breathing in to the count of four, holding for seven, and then out to the count of eight. And again, if you can just do it for even a couple of minutes, a um, couple times a day or even once a day, um, Dr. Andrew Weil has a nice video uh, somewhere on YouTube demonstrating this, but it's a pretty simple concept. But he, he likes to stress to how, you know, bringing the breath all the way into the belly if you can. So then that'll involve some, make sure your, your chest is open, you're a little more relaxed, and you can pull that breath down as deep as you can. And even, and this kind of gets to some of more of the chronic stress stuff that I think um, we talked a little bit about, and maybe you're going to talk about in other panels as well. You can breathe into the pain. You can breathe into the area of stress in the body intentionally, and that can help to create more awareness and to actually create some of that release of tension. 
Another thing that can be helpful if we've got just a lot of adrenaline going at the end of a shift is to actually move. So frequently after work, I'm running, I'm shooting a bow. Um, there's martial arts classes online. There's yoga online. Um, I always separate these things into two things. There's the internal work. So yoga, meditation, breath. And then there's external work, which is also yoga. Um, and more, you know, using the body physically than using the mind. Um, both are good tools. But if, it, if you have a lot of adrenaline, moving the body tends to burn that off a little bit better. And again, I'd like to um, make a pitch just to invite those, any of the frontline workers who would like to participate in the virtual clinic, you are welcome there and we can help you um, with a homeopathic remedy for whatever you have going on specifically. And just to help you become more resilient with your health overall to, to be in better shape for heading in there. Yeah. And I was going to mention, um, so IHAN is currently on a task force with the Somatic Experiencing Trauma Institute on their disaster recovery and response work that they're putting together. And so they are just in the process of releasing this new tool that we've been helping um, collaborate and, and work on this um, discussion on, on the different somatic experiencing tools, which for those of you who are not familiar with somatic experiencing, it's a technique that Dr. Peter Levine um, came up with several decades ago that's all about orienting into your body and regulating the nervous system. And um, they've come up with a, a set of somatic experiencing interventions to be adapted and used in this time of crisis and specifically geared towards frontline workers where it's like, what can someone do in 60 seconds or less. And so it's called SCOPE. Um, and it's an acronym for just five different really quick interventions that you can implement to yourself, um, whether you're just in the hallway at, you know, in the hospital or even I'm a big advocate of um, doing breathing and taking a break when you're in the restroom of just being able to hack those habits together of something that you have to do anyway. Um, so the S stands for slow down, uh, take 10 steps really slowly and just allowing yourself to notice the bottom of your feet. And this is a just really great way to get yourself grounded back into your body, back into the space that you're in. Um, and just taking that moment to orient to that. And then C is to connect to your body um, and then to cross your hands kind of underneath your armpits like this and just allowing your head to kind of gently come down and just being able to feel your body, feel that kind of sense of safety, even if it's just for five seconds or so, just coming back to the body for, for orientation and safety. And then the O is to orient, just to allow your eyes to, to notice something around you, whether it's something um, pleasurable, you know, a, a beautiful color in the hallway or a picture or someone who's walking by who has a interesting outfit on, just uh, orienting to the environment you're in, allowing your nervous system to, to start to feel calm and safe in the place that you are. Um, and then the pedulation piece I like a lot, it's noticing a space in your body that, that feels good, whether it's like the warmth of the sun on your skin or um, even to like coming and touching your heart like this, just feeling the sense of comfort and then allowing yourself to, to notice and enjoy that. And then giving yourself a moment to maybe notice a part of your body that feels a little less comfortable. It could be like a pit in your stomach or something that isn't as pleasurable, but then allowing yourself to notice that for a moment, but then coming back to the, the sensation that does feel more comforting, the, the hand on the heart. Um, and then the E is to engage, is to engage socially, to connect with someone who can support you. So, you know, even if you're at work, it's like having a quick check in with a coworker or sending a text to a loved one of just saying, hey, I'm, I'm needing some extra support. And so um, there, the Somatic Experiencing Tr Trauma Institute is working on 
getting these all printed out into little kind of like business cards and handing them out across the country to all the frontline workers right now, just to be able to give them a tool to, um, to orient themselves and to be able to take, take that 60 second break or two minute break and then, and then get back onto the job. That's really exciting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, also super excited that IHAN is, is involved in that project. So, um, and last, is there any apps or free resources? Like Chris, you mentioned that there's free yoga and things like that. Are there specific apps that you tell your patients about or that you use personally that people have access to? Yeah, I like Down Dog Yoga um, for the yoga. And there's a good meditation app, several. I use Insight Timer. Um, yeah, those are the two main ones I use. I don't really have, uh, other than there's some great meditation apps out there, um, and, and I don't have a, a one that I necessarily recommend. Um, but in terms of people being able to help themselves uh, find a homeopathic remedy to help them with a, a short-term self-limiting condition, um, the National Center for Homeopathy has a really accessible website, and I believe it's mobile-friendly as well, uh, with a remedy finder on it. Um, and again, often like chronic stress is something that you should probably work with a professional on individualizing. But I think it, it's, help, it's a helpful site as far as orienting more to what homeopathic medicine is, where you can find remedies, and helping to actually select a remedy that might help you based on your symptoms. Yeah, and for me, I mean, the, the apps that I use, um, I love Insight Timer as well for, for meditation. And then I've actually been gravitating not towards apps as much as um, finding ways to live stream yoga or qigong or dance has been really powerful for me during this time. I've been, um, I'll give a shout out to Hipline in Oakland. They have uh, several dance classes throughout the day and you can, you know, stream them. It's, um, it's not free, but they're, they're an amazing business. And so I've been happy to support them during this time. And, um, and then just finding different yoga instructors that I, I connect with in terms of their instruction style and, and I'm finding that they're doing live streams either through Zoom or Facebook Live or Instagram. Um, I find that like knowing that I'm, I'm doing that movement or doing that regulation practice live with other people, even though we're separated, like I feel, I feel the heart resonance. I feel the energetic resonance with it. And so it's, um, it's been really helpful. I think it's as opposed to before the shelter in place, I was like using an app called Aptive, which is a, um, it's a great app to just stream any sort of like, hit workout or anything else, but I've just been really craving live connection. Um, but I will say for running, I've been using the Nike running club app. I think that's what it's called. And it's been amazing. I've been really surprised about how much I love it because the, it's all based in mindfulness. Like there's a coach who is guiding you through the run and, um, actually one of the the founders of not insight timer but one of the other mindfulness apps is on there as well and just coaching you through the run in this really mindful and um approach like a stressful stress management approach to running so i've been very surprised how much i've been enjoying that too that's great i know um in the past i used um a hrv app I'm wondering if any of you want to talk about heart rate variability. Um, I can post some of those apps on the Integrative Healers Action Network Facebook page, but I don't know how many people know about heart rate variability and kind of what that means. Can any of you talk to that? Yeah, I, I can talk about it a little bit. It's not an area of expertise, but I know that it's a burgeoning area of scientific inquiry. Um, 
I think like much like with the gut microbiome, we're starting to, to you know, on a scientific level, we're starting to tune in on certain signs and symptoms of the body, of, of health, of having other ways of metrics of what constitutes a healthy resilience response. Um, so, and hopefully we can eventually look at the whole person. <laughs> but I think heart, heart rate variability is one of those um, which relates closely to vagal tone as a concept, um, which is about the vagus nerve amongst other, some other things, but it's about the uh, vagus nerve, which connects with uh, every organ in the body to the brain. So some people would say it, it is the mind-body connection, but I think the mind-body connection is a little bit more than that. But um, so it, it's basically around the concept of um, heart rate variability, how quickly we can re recover in a way from that over um, that fight or flight response in a way. So it's like a tone, a toning up of being able to respond to a threat, but also to recover. And we know that by how quickly our heart rate our heart rate can come down. So people with chronic stress probably have that heart rate going up a lot of time and, and stress hormones up circulating way too much of the time. But if you have a, a good heart rate variability response and a good vagal tone, um, again, we can't, we still need to respond to stress sometimes, but then to be able to calm ourselves more quickly and kind of recover is a very, very important um, response. I don't know if there's more you wanted to say about that, Cynthia. I'd love to give a shout out to HeartMath about, um, yeah, everything that you just described, Kathleen, I think was really spot on, a great description of it. And and HeartMath has been a leader in, um, in sharing really user-friendly tools of being able to um, to work with heart rate variability. And they, they have these, again, really user-friendly like biofeedback mechanisms, which you can use either, they have their simplest one is like you put your thumb on and it, and it's monitoring your heart rate variability, and then it's getting you to, to match um, the ones that they're putting out. And so it's, it's been really cool. I has been able to partner with them and they've developed some, um, some really great, training videos actually for people in, in disasters who are working as a disaster response, you know, in any sort of humanitarian aid of the importance of regulating ourselves before we go and help other people because of um, the frequency of like that, that heart coherence, like, you know, you can, you can feel it. Like when you're in a room with someone and they're super agitated, like, and I think we can even feel it when, um, you know, through Zoom, even though we're not in the same like energetic field in the same way, like they've, HeartMath has just done so much cool research about, about that heart, heart coherence and, um, and the power of if we as an individual are able to regulate ourselves and bring our own, you know, bring back into our own coherence, like the impact that can have on those around us because the, the frequency is shared amongst all of, all those around you. And so, um, yeah, on the IHAN, we can share a, a training video that, that HeartMath has been really generous to share with us, which I think would be a very beneficial tool for every individual right now, because even though we're not, um, on the front lines in the same way that we usually are as an organization, but especially for those who are on the front lines right now, the healthcare workers and other first responders, I think watching this quick video just to learn how to, to bring yourself into coherence would be a really helpful tool. Can anyone speak to sound? And, and stress and anxiety, specifically like binaural sound or music in general? Is anybody using any of that, either for yourselves or for your patients? Yeah, I'll, I'll give out a shout out to a, an artist um, named Billy White, who's on Bandcamp that I see Jenny nodding. Um, beautiful 
relaxing sounds to bring you back into coherence. Um, amazing guy to work with in person as well, but for now we'll have to use his recordings. I'm not so much using sound therapy per se with, with my clients, but I just know that I turn to music <laughs> that I enjoy in times of stress for sure. But I also know there's a, there's a very big um, sound healing movement going on right now. So I, I, I don't know resources uh, either online or on Spotify, perhaps, I'm not sure, but I, I know that a lot of people find it greatly helpful in, uh, in calming and, and in healing on a regular basis. Yeah, I'll echo that. I'm not, um, I don't hold a lot of expertise in that field, but just as a recipient of it, it is so beneficial from the, yeah, Billy White, who you're talking about is amazing. Um, just being able to regulate your nervous system and come back into coherence is a really powerful tool. And there's, um, yeah, there's a lot of different resources that I've seen just even through Instagram or Facebook of different sound healers who are sharing, um, sharing their craft. And then, you know, even just like any type of music is so healing. The research is out there of showing how powerful it is. And so, my advice to anyone out there is just listen to the music that brings you joy. Like the, the healing power of joy is huge. And just being able to get into a different rhythm um, in a different state of mind. And then, and then to, to tout the power of nature as well, just the, the healing sounds that come from nature, you know, of um, I went on a, a walk last week that was along a creek and so I found that as I was like waiting in this creek and there was you know the trickle of the water going by and I just allowed myself to stand there in the water for five minutes and I noticed a huge shift um, in terms of my physical mental emotional energetic well-being it was a really powerful one and um and the birds in my backyard, the singing that they bring, I notice how that's able to bring me back into coherence as well. And so, yeah, just the varying levels of, of finding one, I think what, what you love, like whatever type of music that is, and then, um, and then seeking out other types of sound healers, and then just going outside and listening to the sound of the trees and the wind and the healing that that can bring you, it's powerful. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and Jenny, I, you mentioned something last week in our panel about um, just slowing down in general. And you were talking about how you bring people into the forest. And, you know, it seems like our, our normal way to like hike is we're trying to get somewhere. And I've been thinking about that a lot over the last week. And, you know, even though people say that life is slower, and they're at home and they're not in their cars. I feel like mentally people are really, they're thinking about so many things because, you know, it, they're isolated and they're like, you know, being with themselves and maybe their self-talk is much louder now. Um, and I'm wondering if you can just talk to that whole idea of, of slowing down and, and what that does for stress and anxiety, like physically. Yeah. I mean, I think as a culture, we are addicted to uh, being productive. And in that will translate even in our relaxation, um, you know, recreational things of, you know, going on a hike and being like, I'm going to get to the top of this mountain. It's going to be amazing from point A to point B. And there's huge benefit in that. I'm not, you know, saying that that's not a great thing to do because it is an amazing thing to do in nature is to, to push yourself and in life to do that. But, um, but I think just giving ourselves permission to, to not be productive in certain, especially right now. Like, I think that there's a lot of talk out there of like, all right, you're home. So you should, you know, remodel your house or get super fit or like, there's still this, um, addiction that's coming out right now of of just creating and doing and so 
I think using the, the tools of nature of like, again, like I was sharing earlier of, of mimicking the way that, that nature moves, that the trees move, that, um, following the pace that is there is a huge model for us because what, you know, we forget that we're, we're also in cycles, like the seasons of nature, like probably go from winter to spring to summer, like as a culture, I think that we're really, um, we're kind of a summer culture. Like we want to be like doing things and out in the sun and having fun all the time. And so, um, and that just leads to chronic fatigue, I think, that, that type of hyperactivity. And so, yeah, I think finding opportunities to, um, to even like schedule it in, I do that because I'm still addicted to, <laughs> to, to work and to doing things right now. And so I ha I'll put it in my calendar of like, you know, I've, I have my forest bathing Friday or I am like, I'm going to go on a walk or I'm just going to go sit outside for a half hour. And, you know, it's, um, it takes about, you know, 30 days to start forming a new habit. And so it's like, eat, and just start small. Like, even if we, even if you gave yourself five minutes every day to just go outside and do nothing. Like, you know, call, I call it a sit spot. A lot of people call it that as well of like, just go and sit and don't even like go through your meditation practice, just sit and notice what is happening there and see, see what you notice and just bring curiosity to it. And as time goes on, um, your body and your mind will be craving that time, craving that five minutes. And I think over time, it'll lead to more where it'll be like, well, maybe 10 minutes today or 20 or an hour or who, however that unfolds over time. But, um, but just to start small with it and to bring joy into it. And as not of, of something like, okay, I, I need to be relaxing right now. Just, taking the pressure off because sometimes that can be too much for people to be like, I need to be so focused on relaxing right now, where it's just, if you bring that curiosity and openness to just finding joy and allowing your body and your mind and your eyes to orient to something that brings, that is beautiful and just noticing the beauty for five minutes and just wondering what that, that how that may shift your day. That's so great, thank you. Um, so we have about eight minutes left. I just wanted to um, reiterate that we do have the free homeopathic clinic today from two to four. The Zoom information is on the Integrative Healers Action Network Facebook page. Um, we do have two more of these panels. So the next two Thursdays at 12 o'clock Pacific. Um, and I also just wanted to reach out and let everyone know that we are always looking for volunteers. We're looking for volunteer practitioners. We're looking for volunteer administrative support. Those positions can be long-term, they can be short-term. It's really whatever you can offer. Um, so if you're interested in any of that, I would appreciate you looking at the Integrative Healers Action Network website. Um, you can find all the information about how to contact us on our Facebook page. And then I just wanted to check in with you all. Again, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate every single one of you. Um, is there any final thoughts that you want to leave with our audience today around stress and anxiety? Any takeaways you want to make sure that people captured? There's some people who have gotten on a little bit late, so maybe just share your, your, your golden nuggets well, I think we, we've all talked a lot today about to some in different ways about bringing awareness to this, to the fact that we are stressed and having signs and symptoms of recognizing that. And I just want to re reiterate that one because I think that in and of itself, even though it sounds very obvious and it can feel like, but what do I do? But what do I do is the next question. But just to trust that that in and of itself is healing. And that that in and of itself will help you find your individual path to helping you address, you know, if you have chronic stress. 
Yeah, again, I'll, I'll emphasize that I see stress as an opportunity for bringing out the best in us, um, all the best art of any sort always arises out of stress, never in the reverse from what I've found so far. And, um, you know, so this is a time where we can really ask ourselves what we really want to be doing with our time and how we can really um, utilize that stress energy for, uh, for a better planet and for a better time with our families. Um, one last thing, you know, we've talked about a lot of modalities you know, with the five senses, basically, you know, touch, changing what we're seeing, um, go out into nature and look, um, smell, stop and smell the roses. Um, flower essences are amazing for dropping anxiety, things like lavender that we didn't really touch on. But, you know, most of us have a preferred sense that we like to heal with. For some of us, it'll be auditorily. They'll love Billy White's work and other people like that. Um, so just kind of, um, like, uh, like Jenny was talking about plan, plan this into your day, little moments of reprieve. Yeah, I really resonate with everything that was shared by Chris and Kathleen. And, um, you know, I think one of my biggest takeaways is just a shared, like, just focusing on kindness right now to ourself and to others and, you know, bringing kindness to our day and to, if we're having a really challenging day, you know, knowing that giving yourself five minutes to, to go do nothing, to not be productive, to not have to, to be anything but just yourself, like remembering that we are all more than enough during this time, just by, by showing up and being present um and like kathleen said bringing awareness to what is happening i i really believe that that just awareness can can create that shift can ca help facilitate the pause so that we can choose what how we want to respond to something um and then kindness to others right now too especially those who are are on the front lines you know going out to the grocery stores and you know i've witnessed some um some some checkers who have been kind of harassed by you know by patrons and things like that and so kind of going overboard in the kindness to people that you encounter because we don't we don't know what their situation is like at home and um and there's something so powerful and healing about sharing that kindness with others that can help regulate ourselves as well in bringing i think the um again, the, the gratitude that can open our heart to, to ourselves and to each other. And that can help, like Chris was saying, I think that stress can be a really powerful tool to catalyze us into what's next. And I, and I have hope that for what's next is going to be um, more beautiful and powerful than, than now. Well, thank you all so much. I, again, I really appreciate you guys showing up today and sharing all of your wisdom and supporting our mission of transforming trauma into resiliency. Um, I look forward to next Thursday and I hope you guys have a great day. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Cynthia. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Yeah, Take care. Everyone.